I wanted to invite you to join our first ever virtual community running challenge. We're calling it the Summer Running Challenge. It starts July 14th and goes all the way through to August 11th, which is the end of the Olympics, the closing ceremony day. So that's easy to remember. And this is how it works. We're going to put a link in the show notes for this episode. Click on it, and then you can sign up for a mileage-based goal that you think you might be able to attain in that 28-day period. Or you can keep it open if you don't want the pressure of having to hit a certain number of of miles. Sign up for it. We're going to send you a t-shirt, an exclusive Marathon Handbook t-shirt, which is quite nice. I've got one. They're pretty, pretty nicely designed. They're really nice. And you're also going to be entered in to win a slew of prizes. We're going to do like weekly mini prize packs. And then we've got one big grand prize pack package that includes uh, Saucony Endorphin Speed 4 shoes. Uh, shout out to Saucony for, for throwing those in there. Uh, and as well, Sunto Sonic headphones and a backpack, a prize pack from KT Tape. I think getting another shirt as well. There's a whole bunch of stuff going to be in there. Uh, so we're also going to have a, a Strava group, uh, so we can so you can log your mileage really easily, and a Facebook group so we can have a little bit of community chatter as well. I know uh, me and the rest of the gang at at Marathon Handbook are also going to participate in this, so we'll share what we're doing, um, some tips and that sort of thing along the way. So this is. This is for all ability levels. Uh, you know, doesn't really matter what you're going to hit in terms of your mileage goal. We just thought it would be fun to to motivate the community to get out and keep running, especially during the dog days of summer. And uh, we thought it'd be a fun thing to try. So, again, you can find a link to join our challenge in the show notes, uh, or go to our website marathonhandbook.com, where you'll find a link, or just go to raceroster.com and search summer running challenge so running without the g running challenge all right look forward to uh to seeing you there and uh it's gonna be a fun summer let's get to the show i'm joined by my colleagues alex sear and caitlin tossi guys i can't believe i'm going to say this but i'm excited about a treadmill we've what? got it yeah what what <laughs> yeah no, I like it. It's this very good. This podcast is no. Um, <laughs> we're gonna chat a little bit about gear because there's been some sort of wild and there's been wild and wacky gear stuff this week. So we thought we'd do a little quick roundup talking about gear, and uh, we're gonna talk about a treadmill first. Then after that, we're gonna get into the main topic of the pod, which is teasing Alex's forthcoming YouTube video entitled Alex. My five favorite early season workouts. Right. So we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about workouts. We're going to talk, talk about our favorite workouts, our most feared workouts, workouts we do to test our fitness, to know when we're ready for the big race and, uh, weirdest workouts we've done, neatest places in the world where we've run workouts and so on and so forth. But first let's talk, let's talk that gear. So Wahoo, which is a cycling company. Ha, his, has been a cycling company since uh, they've been around about a little bit more than a decade they're based in Atlanta. They have kind of like the best in class bike trainer. I, I've, I've rode on the bike trainer many, many times. Uh, brother-in-law owns one. They're pretty rad. Like they're really good. And uh, the Cadillac of bike trainers. <laughs> and they announced in Boston this year when Alex and I were there covering that they were coming out with a treadmill. Okay. Treadmills. How do you guys feel about treadmills? Let's be honest here. God, it's so hard to do workouts on treadmills. I feel like it's eternal. Yeah. Eternal. Even if it's an easy run, a workout is actually a little easier because you're switching up the speed, but anything I do, it feels a million times harder on a treadmill. Yeah. I don't know about you guys, like so much harder. Yeah. It's something about the stride. I don't know. Like I can yeah. get on a treadmill and feel like I'm running quickly, but I'm nowhere near my actual workout pace. Exactly. I, I have like two moves, easy run on the treadmill if I have to, and a progressive run on the treadmill if I have to do a workout. So basically mm -hmm. you park it at whatever, seven, seven and a half miles an hour, and then you increase every mm -hmm. couple minutes. Makes for a good progressive run, but like, that's it. 
-hmm. Yeah, you have to like engage your brain or it's just so torturous. Like even if even if you're binge watching old Seinfeld episodes or whatever, it's just it's just like absolutely painful. Michael, that is exactly what I'd be watching on the treadmill. Totally. It's like an entire season of Seinfeld. Totally. (laughs) Now, but this is exciting. We are in Boston and we are invited to go uh test a prototype of the Wahoo Kicker Run. And they promise that this treadmill is something totally different. I think the marketing was like, this is not a treadmill, sort of like the Magritte paintings or whatever. And so Alex, we went there, uh, you were the guinea pig, you jumped on the treadmill. We, we shot a bunch of video. So like, you know, spoiler alert or, or teaser, we're going to have a first impressions video coming out very soon on this exact, uh, product. But like, what was your impressions of it? Like why, and why is it different, Alex? Well, I guess the main thing, and it, this is their marketing, and I think it holds up. It's mm-hmm. like you don't respond to the treadmill. The treadmill responds to you, right? So instead of getting on the treadmill, choosing a speed, and then running on it like we usually do, the treadmill has sensors, like built-in sensors, that will capture and understand how quickly you're running and then adapt its own pace to you. And that's optional. You can go the old-fashioned way. The, the this way is called the run free mode so basically you can turn it on or off and then also it's pretty techy product so you can do that and then look at a screen in front of you and it connects to this app called zwift which if you're a cyclist you're probably familiar with maybe less so if you're a runner it creates a digital avatar of yourself running on a screen making it harder when you go up hills making it easier when you go down the hills passing people, depending on like your own pace and speed, you you can race people from all over the world. It's pretty cool. I'd never tried Zwift before. And no, it was, it was cool. The marketing too, was that the treadmill could go in four minute mile pace. Yeah. Like the guy told me, he's like Mm -hmm. this on this treadmill, you can go four minutes per mile. And I was like, man, I can't even do that on land. (laughs) So of course I had to try. And it was neat. It was neat. Um, I did a good workout on it. Um, yeah. I, yeah. Everyone was gathered. Yeah. Everyone was gathered around Alex watching that it was weird. down four minute mile pace. No, not for an entire, oh, mile, but like you had, pan, you had fans. Yeah. Well, I had to try pace. the four minute mile pace. And I mean, I, I wow. held it maybe 30 seconds sprinting yeah. on the treadmill and, uh, and yeah, it, it held up. It was cool. Like I'd never run that fast on a treadmill before. Yeah. I I'm genuinely excited by this product. I, I can't believe I'm saying that I'm excited about a treadmill. It's something that, uh, you know, I think the term dreadmill is well earned. I find tre- yes. treadmills are just torturous and I try to avoid them at all costs. But I think that this, like just watching you running on it, Alex in Boston, and, you know, hopefully we get uh, another chance to to do a more in-depth testing on it in the near future. It's coming out this fall. It's about 5,000 bucks. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, and it's on pre-order right now. We're, we're just like, we're, we're, se- we're selling it for them right now. But I think, <laughs> I, I actually think this might be a revolutionary running product. Uh, certainly for those of us living in extreme climates, uh, like extreme North, like in Canada or even Caitlin, in your case, Costa Rica. I mean, it's like when it's like 110 degrees in the summertime there, or do you guys even have a summer? I, um, we do the summer, but it's going to sound kind of funny because the summer is actually the, the, the season that's a little easier to run in because it's drier in the rainy season. I feel it gets a little more humid once like our prime summer months are over. Um, but if it's raining a lot during the rainy season is a really good time to have a treadmill. Cause if you have to run in the afternoon and it's just like downpouring and thunder and lightning, and you can't get out there, there are, that, that would be a really good mo- um, moment to have one of these treadmills or any treadmill. So, um, yeah, we could, we could definitely use it, especially a lot of my runners in the States these days are saying that the weather is just out of control. Yeah. The heat and humidity, one from California telling me it was 118 degrees where she was living. So she's, you know, she's having to do her, her running on, on, on a treadmill. And I'm sure a lot of people are to get them in and be safe these days. So the three of us, all three of us, we need to get, we need to get three of these kicker run yes, treadmills, please. and then we need to like start potting while running together. And we can mm-hmm. all be running the same Zwift course at the same time. That's we can fun. even hold hands. No. Oh, I don't think we can do that. There's a Zwift, like there's a feature you have to unlock where you can hold hands with the person next to you virtually. That'd be nice. Mm. Well, you'll have to keep pace for that. <laughs> oh, oh, shots fired. 
I know you guys can count me out, but I'll be the, you know, the one cleaning up the back. <laughs> if there are any, if there are any stragglers, I'll, I'll get them. The sweeper. <laughs> the sweeper. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So speaking, speaking of technological advancements, do you guys see that Tracksmith, the New England running brand has released a timepiece? I did, that's not where I think you were. Thought you were going when you said technological advancement. How how is this a technological advancement? Yeah, should we be switching out our Garmin's and Apple watches for the Tracksmith? So a little bit of background for those of you listening who are like, <laughs> Times uh, Tracksmith released a watch. Yes, Times uh, tra- Timesmith, <laughs> Time Lord uh, Tracksmith released this week. They dropped a super limited edition watch. They called. They call it a running watch. It's a what? What's the language? No, no. They say we didn't want to make another running watch. We made a watch for runners. Right. Yeah. So it's this a time is piece. it's a timepiece. Time. It's literally called the Tracksmith timepiece. It's a collaboration with a French brand, Merci, and uh, and this company that sells vintage watches called Wind Vintage. I wasn't sure if it was Wind. Let's see, let's see what they they could have done there. It's actually uh-huh. Wind, the guy, the guy who created the company, his last name's Wind. They sell like you can buy like a, a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar Rolex on their site. Uh, so it's a collaboration between these three high end brands. It's a limited numbered edition watch. I believe there are a hundred available. Seven hundred ish US dollars sold out. Guys can't buy one. That's crazy. Is the Mel C brand the same one that makes the chocolate? Don't think so. Okay. They make little like cashmere beanies and that sort of thing. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Like $70 tote bags, that sort of stuff. So even if someone wanted one, it's over. It's over. They're sold out. It's over. <laughs> we can't do We Yeah. Okay. This watch. Okay. I, I want to love Tracksmith all the time because they're trying to do something different. I think there's a place for a more expensive product out there in the marketplace Let's not kid ourselves. Many runners have deep pockets. Some of the, like Tracksmith stuff, some of it looks good. And when you talk to the Tracksmith people, like Alex and I, when we were in Boston, we had this like amazing conversation with their, their shoe designer. And he was, he was a great guy. And it was a really insightful conversation. He knew a lot about shoes and it makes you like want to believe in what they're doing. And then they do shit like this. And it's like, okay, it's, it's, it's a, it's a analog watch with a, Yep. Half skin leather strap. They, it's waterproof, guys. It's it, water resistant. It, I'm sorry, water resistant. <laughs> but not swim with it. <laughs> Don't swim with it, but Don't you sweat. can sweat on it, except I'm not yes. really sure how the calf skin band is going to hold up to sweat. Could Caitlin wear it throughout a podcast, sweating in her shack over there and still have the watch work at the end? <laughs> can you wear it BD. during the day? <laughs> <laughs> thanks, it, thanks for sharing that it's warm <laughs> well it's what 100 it's degrees warm. plus don't hold let it me, against you let me explain a moment just i need to do a parenthesis a little a side note here it's because the air conditioner is too loud <laughs> so, <laughs> so i do have to you know we're doing the videos that's why it's a little warm it's a workplace yeah. violation that's right it's a work <laughs> exactly the, the 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 noise is too loud on the ac to put it on right now so that's why but yeah um we could give it a try i think track Smith should make one more and send it to me, and I will be the tester for the water resistance. Uh, number uh, number one hundred and one goes to yeah. Caitlin of the hundred. <laughs> this watch is ridiculous. It's it's a friggin' it's a watch. It's a it's got it's got three it's got three arms to it, uh, three hands to it, three arms. I called them arms, hands, three hands to the watch. So it tells seconds. Great. There's there's nothing runnery about this watch at all. Like, have you guys have you guys ever tried to do a workout using an analog watch before? Yes. Really? I learned what Garmin was in 2010. <laughs> but I think they're trying to draw on that romantic period of running where coaches had stopwatches. So like you kind of have your own stopwatch and you try to do a hundred, 400 meters in 60 seconds and start at the 12 and finish at the 12. Maybe that's what they're playing. Otherwise, I think they crossed the line. I think Tracksmith so far was in this category with Lululemon and these like upscale 
good fabric clothing that that's a little bit that's sold at a higher price point because the quality is a bit better maybe disregard the the elliot runner that we talked about last week that to me missed the mark but their clothing was good this is more balenciaga than lululemon to me they're really relying on their name they're not giving much to the consumer i don't think tracksmith is there yet in the world of running or elsewhere i'm surprised that this thing sold out i wouldn't buy it i wouldn't go for it i i don't know it missed the mark for me there's a hundred fools out there is that is was that the, the run a hundred watches that's it yeah okay well of course it's sold out there you go well, that's such a small that's such a small run yeah no this it is, is just nice weird. looking though i have to be honest i understand it wouldn't work for my running but i have to say it's nice looking it's a great looking watch i mean listen like if somebody gave me this watch as a gift for maybe not a tracksmith version of this watch because if it was a tracksmith version of this watch you'd be like oh you gave me a running watch that's not a running watch cool thanks but like if this was like i don't know if they gave me an old uh just think an old Seiko watch that's like an analog watch. It's kind of a cool gift. It looks nice. Yeah. It's like it's yeah, it's got that kind of like that sort of Brooks Brothers preppy kind of aesthetic. Yes, to it. Exactly. The but, preppy look. That's but what this I is the running watch. This is the wa running watch. This is the watch you put on after you're done running and you've got to like, I don't know, you're going out to see some friends or for a dinner or whatever. Or you don't like wearing a Garmin for whatever reason. Like right. Yeah. All right, watch this segue, guys. <laughs> Unlike the Tracksmith running watch, which is not an, at all a running watch, it's just calling itself a running watch or a, ro a watch for runners, rather. Watch Excuse perfect. me. Mm -hmm. On the Swiss brand has maybe revolutionized the running shoe this week. Do you guys watch this video that they they dropped on YouTube and kind of did the rounds in all media? We did a story on it. I think every media outlet did a story on it. They did a really good job getting the the, the reach out there. Yeah. Where a robotic arm at their uh, innovation lab in Switzerland, a robotic arm is trained to use a glue gun, and it basically like it's almost like it's um, shooting like spider web Spider Man style, and it's yeah. creating a shoe in under six minutes by basically shooting glue at a, a foot shaped last, um, like a model foot. And it creates a super shoe in under six minutes. This is insane. Absolutely yeah. insane. Yeah. We're, I think at this point in the running world, we're trained to look for gimmicks and discount them because there have been so many, but this one caught my attention for a couple of reasons. One, it has the specs of a super shoe it's six ounces which is very light lighter than all your vapor flies your alpha flies all of them and then two it's like it's proven right i think on did a good job because they gave it to helen obiri she went ran boston in this shoe won the race and now they release it and can say listen this is tried and true so as weird as it is it's legit yeah, that was interesting watching um, an interview with with Helen O'Veary and also the creators of the shoe just sweating it out when they gave it to her to run the marathon. And they said that when they gave her the shoe, she looked at the shoe and she's like, I'm not wearing that. Like her first response was no way. Well, I mean, there are no, no laces. laces. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. No laces. I'm not wearing that. And I can't blame her. And I'm glad that, that she took the chance when the company was must be psyched. She took the chance, but they were definitely sweating during that marathon. Yeah. I mean, this one kind of snuck by us as well. I, I remember Alex, you and I talked about what was on her feet when she crossed the finish line in Boston, because in particular, a like we're shoe nerds and we're always interested in what's in, on everyone's feet, especially when it comes to su super shoes, especially in this era where like a company will, a company has to declare in advance that the shoe exists. And if it's a prototype, they have to release a limited number of pairs and they have to send the name of the shoe to World Athletics so it can get on a list. And somehow this shoe sort of snuck by me. We saw it in Boston and she ran like a crazy last closing couple of miles. Like her, she ran like a four. 20 something mile, I think to close the marathon and win. Um, it was extraordinary. So obviously the shoes like 
It's good. It's good. It's good. They're good. <laughs> yeah. They're not falling off her feet. That's for sure. Especially that's, I think the concern when there's, the shoe doesn't have laces, right? You can't kind of tighten it up, but this right. is kind of neat. Like the, the, the creators of this shoe were saying that first of all, it reduced their carbon footprint and creating an upper by like 75%, you know, which you, you see this kind of like a, a tactic of using, talking about, uh, uh, climate change and about reducing carbon footprint as kind of a marketing gimmick these days. And I, I'm kind of becoming cynical about it, but in this case, you can see that you're like, you're watching the shoe being spun into existence over the course of a few minutes. And you can see how efficient this thing is, right? right. Versus the old way of doing things, which is like basically cutting out uh, an upper out of a larger fabric uh, swatch and then chucking the rest of it away. Um, right. even recycling it. I mean, that just takes a lot of time. So, or a lot, it, it has a, a carbon footprint to have to recycle something. Right. So you can see how there's the efficiencies here, the, the time, the automation factor, but then also what on is hitting upon is they're like, we see a future where this technology is maybe localized or at least regionalized. And like, your foot can get scanned and we can produce a shoe specifically for you, for your foot. That's like perfect for your foot, yeah. which is very, very cool. Yeah. yeah. Also a more humane way of making shoes. You don't want to know where the shoes that you're wearing right now are made likely, right? We're, we're relying on sweatshops all over the world. Imagine if in every big city or even in every running store, eventually there is this robot arm that makes shoes right in front of you. Much more humane way to put things on your feet. And also I think that's where the future is going. Just side note, people will have shoes that are very specific to them and not just guess between a bunch of companies. So now nah, this is neat. This this might actually just be a, a, a prelude to the future of buying running shoes. And uh, I think I'm going to get to try a pair. I'm very excited to try them. Lucky. We'll see. Nothing's confirmed yet. So uh, my, my plea to on once again on this podcast. Subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can see Mr. Alex Sear test out. It's called the lace up the shoe. No, wait, no, no. Nope. Uh, <laughs> Put the shoes. It's called the light. No, I got that. Cloud wrong. boom. Cloud, Cloud boom. boom. Uh -huh. Right. Okay. L S yep. for right. light spray. There we go. I think you should take these shoes, get your, your Wahoo four minute mile on the treadmill. Oh, Do you think it'll happen? Yes. That is the, with the track Smith watch. I, oh my God. <laughs> you can time your four minute mile with uh, the same watch Roger Bannister wore when he first broke the, the record. <laughs> what do you need to run a four minute mile? Just $10,000 of gear <laughs> and a can do attitude. <laughs> and a can do attitude. I like that. There we go. That is the experiment. So there's going to be the, the uh, on has said that there will be limited pairs available coming this fall in the lead up to the New York City Marathon. And uh, who won the New York City Marathon last year? Helen O'Beary. That's right. So mm -hmm. interesting. maybe there's some hype leading up to the New York City Marathon this year, and she's probably going to be back. So that's cool. I mean, that's a nice, nice fit. So there we go. All right, guys, let's take a break, and then we're going to get right into... Our favorite workouts, our most feared workouts, our best ever workout experiences, our workout failures. We're going to talk all about workouts right after this. All right, and we're back. A key feature of any running plan is the workout. So Alex, we're doing this on the occasion of uh, your forthcoming uh, YouTube video, which is entitled your five favorite early season workouts, right? Mm -hmm, right. All right. Give us a teaser here. What's uh, give us one of the workouts that you've got in those, in that top five. Ooh, okay. I'll give, I won't give you my top one. I'll okay. give you like number, th I think it's number three. Okay. So there's this workout I learned to do in college early in the season in college is the time when you're super hung up on pace and you're competing with yourself from last year and other people i like this workout because it prevented you from doing any of that because it's so obscure that you can't really tell how fast you're going it's just a crazy fartlek 
you start running hard for 30 seconds and then you match that time with easy running. So 30 seconds hard, 30 seconds easy, and you repeat that sequence. So for the 45 seconds hard, 45 seconds easy, one minute hard, one minute easy. You go all the way up to 90 seconds and that's the first half of the pyramid and then you go back down. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. So in the end, you get just over 10 minutes of hard running, which isn't all that much. So it's manageable for early in the season. The easy running parts should be done at like normal easy running pace. If you shuffle, you kind of defeat the purpose. It is meant to be a workout to build up your aerobic system. And also the hard parts are not meant to be done at full speed. It's like early season speed. So call it, you know, 50% speed, then 90% speed, 50% speed, maybe 85% speed. Okay. And it's tough. It's a lot tougher than you think. And I think that's just... That's just a characteristic of fartlicks because you're never actually completing a full kilometer of running hard. You don't get any sexy splits. So you just think, well, all right, this is this is an easy workout. And uh, every time I've done it, I've hurt a lot. And it kind of it's it's a stinger to build your fitness early on. Yeah, it doesn't sound easy because the rest just fly by. Those are some short rests. And you're never fully resting, right? right. That That's the issue. Right. You never quite recover as much as you think you would. Okay. I, I like this. I, I'm I'm like gonna write all these down. I need some new, I need some new stuff. Get the pen and paper out. Get yeah, that, exactly. <laughs> the thing you don't get from this workout, down. though, you don't get much mileage. So, Caitlin, you're becoming a mileage hog. I don't know if this would fit to your current <laughs> training plan. I just yeah. have to warm up for half an hour and cool down for half an hour or something like that. Yeah, like what's the ultra version of this? Like you do like uh, thirty one... minutes hard, thirty minutes yeah. easy, forty five minutes hard. That's right. You do a 10 hour run. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm actually doing a very similar workout tonight to that one. I'm doing 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, 30 times. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. I've done that one before. Yeah. yeah also hard. Yeah. These short, the, the, the short speed set, like short speed, short rest sounds easy until you realize that the rest is too short. Yeah. Until you're doing it. Yeah. yeah. How about you, Kaylin? Um, okay, mine is mine is a completely different there. Um, there's one that we put together a couple of years ago, or I think last year. It's called the Double Pump Hills. And so, <laughs> so yeah, my husband's really good at putting together these like cool names for the workouts that he that he makes up. So I think this is good for trail runners, but also road runners as well, because you can just choose what kind of hill you want to do it on, whether it's super steep or a trail or uh, or not so steep. Um, so what you do is you got to warm up, you know, so we warm up for like 20 minutes flat running and then you do 10 times 30 seconds hard uphill. So now we're saying hard, like a, probably a little harder than the, cause you guys are floating in, in the rests for the ones that you mentioned, like you're, you're, you're still running pretty hard. Um, pretty. So 30 seconds hard uphill, stop completely for 30 seconds and then 30 seconds really hard uphill again. So just oh, really okay. giving that super sprint twice. So that's why it's, you got the double pump. So double. 30 seconds, super hard, stop in your tracks, continue going up the hill, 30 seconds, super hard, jog back down to the start point And again, and do it Oof. 10 times. Yeah. That is brutal. So you need like a 60 second equivalent hill of like, if you ran all out for 60 seconds, that's the length of the hill. Exactly. Yep. And how long is the rest between like in the middle, the standing rest? Um, oh, it's 30 seconds. You're mm -hmm. right. Yep. 30, 30, 30. Yeah. Sorry if I didn't mention that. 30, 30, 30. And then try to just jog back down as time. as you can. You could walk if you wanted to. I mean, you know, you can, and you can also try it if someone wants, is listening and wants to try it out and you're new to this kind of work, you know, you could try and just do four, you know, just yeah. do five and then you try to, up. you know, build up, build up as you go. Maybe take four weeks, try to do it for four weeks and start with four and then add an, add a rep each week and see how it goes. I don't do standing rest very often. Like I know a lot of like shorter and middle distance runners do standing rest. I, yeah. I, I haven't often done workouts where I, you know, like say like hard two hundreds and then you just do standing rest. I've seen other people doing this over the years at, at tracks, but like yeah. I've never, I don't really ever I usually do sort of like active recovery or, or just jog recovery, but like, that's brutal. That sounds awful. Caitlin, like <laughs> we could your husband is with uh, me. yeah it's disturbing we could we could modify it for you michael and you could walk continue to walk up the hill for the 30 seconds i like that i want to stop yeah you could do that that would work i do i do a hill i do hill sessions on a pretty steep long 
um, grindy hill here in Toronto called Pottery Road Hill. So at the few people from Toronto listening will be like nodding along. Yes, I, I know that hill. It's a it's sort of an, a notorious uh, workout hill for runners. And cyclists love to bomb down it as well. And at the very top of the hill is a Dairy Queen, like a like a ice cream shop. Oh. Um, and uh, the joke is always just that I'm just like, just going to bail at, at some point in one of these hill repeats and just end up in the Dairy Queen ordering myself a... Have you? Have you done this? I've never done it. Blizzard mid-workout? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A blizzard. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. That's a good idea. Like uh, four hills, ice cream, Sunday, banana split, blizzard, and then <laughs> back down four more hills. That's cool. Oh, that's a recipe for disaster. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I love including milk, dairy products in my workouts. <laughs> and a lot of it. Yeah. It really strengthens the stomach. Yeah. <laughs> um, my, my, actually a workout that I did many years ago in a group setting. So you need, you need five or six people that are around the same ability level as you. And it, it, it's come to mind as like a really fun and engaging way to do a workout. And it's something that I've uh, incorporated with the kids that I coach at um, my son's elementary school, uh, coach the track and cross teams at the, with oh, the elementary that's school. A bit of information. Yeah. And oh, uh, 30 times by 400. Mike? It's, it's the, we do the once a runner workout. It's, yeah. uh, it's, we go, we go 60 times 400, you know. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Start them young. Good. Yeah, just, you know, 30 seconds jog rest in between. Um, Got to keep the volume up, you know. Uh, no, we do Kayla like... vigorously um, shaking her head. Like, no. We do a version of a workout that I found reading about the history of cross-country running and how it came from, uh, like, these various, like, basically grammar schools and public schools would, would have, like, a... A, a running team and they would compete with each other and compete with other schools. And it used to be like, um, there's a paper chase where you had to like, uh, chase down somebody who had like carrying a, a note a piece of paper. I'm butchering the, the Wikipedia article I read five years ago on this, but, um, basically the workout that I came up with was sort of a version of one of these like late 19th century, early 20th century games that these school kids would play uh, and that eventually created cross country, which is like, say you got six kids in a group and they're all sort of at the same ability level. You give them each, um, a number and then you start all running together. And the rule is, is you've got to start together and end together. Uh, so that it kind of like, even if the group sort of like starts to split apart, everyone has to kind of come back together and work as a team. And your each kid is allowed to surge between uh like 10 and 30 seconds or like an or or like a full lap or anything under a full lap and basically you just like call the number out at random and then like what whatever kid kind of like goes to the front and pushes to the front and runs kind of like the pace that they kind of want to run they, they get to lead for say 30 seconds or a lap and they get to throw down whatever pace they think the group they think they can handle and then it's like a game right because you're like i don't want to go too hard because if i go uh super hard and someone else decides they're going to go even harder am i going to be able to survive this so it's, there's like a little weird the sort of tactical element to it it's it sounds very convoluted but once you get it going it's quite a bit of fun it's like basically like just creating a game uh, uh turning a workout into a game so you know it's super cool because last weekend uh, when we went on our long run with the with the running club, we uh, randomly I just said to the group of six or eight that we were running with, I said, "Okay, okay, guys, get in a single file line." So we did that like single file line where the person at the back then had to run up to the front, and then the person at the back then had to run up to the front, and we did it in this in this flat section and then this downhill, and we got to the uphill, and they were like, "We don't want to do it anymore, Coach Kate." And I was like, "Okay." <laughs> I guess, I guess the game is over. I guess. Yeah, but, it's fine. but it was it was similar. It was similar to that. And it was su it was super fun. Well, I thought it was fun. I don't think they thought it was very fun. A couple of years ago, uh, when it, myself and my two closest training partners, we were training for Chicago. Uh, we were both we were all three of us were right around the same ability level and the same fitness. And we trained together on the same program for the entire season and we're getting late into the season and we're doing mile repeats and we go to the track 
And what we did is we each took a turn uh, pacing a mile. And the goal was to hit the uh, lap split within one second of, wow. Wow. of what you're trying to hit. That's a slim margin. Yeah. And, yeah. and if anybody fell off, they lost the privilege of being able to, because I think we did, I forget how many, it was like six times a mile and we each had two opportunities to pace out the mile. And if you were more than a second off, uh, you were like, it was like maybe two seconds off. Like say, like it was like basically like a window of a few seconds. Basically no one's allowed to clown around or push the pace and you lose your, your pacing privilege the second time around if, uh, if you don't nail it. So I thought that was actually a really smart way of doing things. Cause we all, the, the focus became not showing off or right. fading from the front or, or sandbagging it. The, the focus became hitting the number and, mm. and then we were kind of like celebrating it when we did it, you know, like you, you, you do like the second lap, you just, you know, the, the 800 split of your, of your mile and you'd look at your watch and you'd have like a 70, whatever. And you'd be like, be like, perfect and and then like okay good job keep going you know like so it was it was like a it was a really good exercise in being disciplined and being even and just kind of feeling that pace i i thought that was actually a really smart way of doing things cool strategy yeah it's like gamifying workouts yeah i remember yeah i think one of my favorite workouts to ever do was something like that but it, it was a little bit more competitive so you'd have a bunch of guys at the track with this once in college and the perp the, the idea was the last person to finish every lap would be eliminated until there would only be one person left and so that becomes very strategic it's like a race N no one can choose to take it out you might all go really slowly and kick at the end or and this is what usually happens someone does take it out and they get way ahead you know 100 200 meters ahead of everybody else to safeguard themselves for a while but then eventually the rest of the pack catches up it's like choose your own venture and I thought it was really cool because not only does it get you fitter because it's a lot of pace changes, it simulates a race. It's something to do a bit later in the season. That's smart. I like that. I've heard of other university teams, like college teams doing that over the years. That must be a very common, like a, a, a trick of the trade for uh, a varsity running coach to employ that. That's a good one. Although like a game of attrition and very ruthless as well at the same time. So uh, have you guys ever done any of the like, the famous workouts, the, we've talked in the past on a pod about Mona, the Mona workout, the Mona Getty workout, which is a, another version of a, a, a fart lick workout, uh, that I find really brutal, really hard, but also a really good fitness test. You guys ever do a Mona before? I have no. no. Okay. So just oh, really quickly, try. it's <laughs> two times 90 seconds on 90 seconds off. So on being, you can choose what that means for you it can be like i think typically it's more like uh, around 10k your 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 10k goal pace uh and then the off is supposed to be not easy it's supposed to be float which just means you're supposed to apply a bit of pressure you're trying to stay in a kind of a more upright aerobic and you're not just dragging your feet along and trying to catch your breath so it's 90 seconds on 90 seconds off twice and then you go four times, 60 seconds on, 60 seconds off, four times, 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, and then four times, 15 seconds on, 15 seconds off. Just absolutely brutal, That's but tough. a really good fitness test. Yeah, it sounds tough. And then the Yasso 800s. Either of you ever try the Yasso 800s? No, and I apparently <laughs> neither has he, right? Wasn't there a thing that came up? Yeah. Bart Yasso just realized, like, what? This workout's based on my trip, never done this thing. He may not, he may not publicly admit to this, but I sat for an entire day with him in Vancouver at the expo for the Vancouver marathon several years ago. And he admitted to me at one point, he's like, I am most well known for this workout. And I did not invent that workout. I did not do that workout. Um, it, although it's a cool thing to be known for. So the, the, the conceit of that one is you do 10 times 800 meter repeats on a track and your time, your number time for each 800, if you do them evenly is like a, a predictor for your marathon. So, and that's also your rest time, right? 
I believe so. Yes. I think oh, it's you equal. rest equal to what you ran. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think and so. it's a complete rest. Believe so. Uh, you, you jog. I think. Let's ask Bart. Oh, you jog. Okay. If you ask Bart, you'd be like, I have no idea. I don't know. <laughs> you make it up. Um, and call them the Seer 800s. Sure. I'll, I'll at least do them once. Yeah. If I can get the name. Yeah. I think it is equal rest. And I think what okay. it is, the idea is you run it on a track, you, 800, obviously two laps on the track, a 400 meter track. And then you, you take the, say you're doing a, say you're trying to break three hours in a marathon and you want to try to do the three minute 800s evenly okay. 10 times. You run three minutes, easy rest over the course of just one lap. So right. Okay. That it. makes sense. So that would work out, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And if you can do that in a balanced way, the theory is that this is a, a golden predictor late in the season for what your marathon time will be. Although I think it's complete BS, but it's a neat workout. And it's also, it's, I think a really good, uh, a really good sort of lactate threshold workout yeah. to employ. Sounds really painful. And then of course the aforementioned once a runner workout, which is the novel once a runner, the main character, Quentin Cassidy goes out and runs a 400 workout and he does how many 400s? He starts with 20, right? He starts with 20 and that's the initial workout. And then his coach comes out, Bruce Denton, and makes him do another 20. It's like one more, one more, one more until he gets to 40 okay. by 400. And then, and then there's more. I, I think he ends up doing 60. I need to reread. This book is right behind me on the shelf. I need to reread it. But something tells me he does 60 at the end. Please don't do this at home, folks. Please. That's like with, <laughs> if it's equal rest, because it, it, or yeah, it would be equal. I mean, that's like he's running like an ultra. Yep. Mm -hmm. And the whole, the, the whole book is based around, he's trying to, he's preparing for like a mile race. <laughs> That's like 50 Again, a fictional character. Yeah. Okay. And runs 50K or whatever it is. I feel like every few years, there's a let's run.com thread about that workout and about whether or not some young fool tries to, to do the, the Quentin Cassidy 400 repeats. Absolute insanity. Uh, weirdest 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 or most glorious place you've ever done a workout we've all tr had to travel for work or for pleasure and you find yourself on vacation in some lovely place and then you end up running a, a a strange workout in an amazing part of the world or just like a total wacko spot where you're like being that insane a type runner and you're like i can't possibly miss this workout i'm going to for example run on the one treadmill on a cruise ship uh in order to get my workout in mm. which i did once i would go with the former had i not already dished a couple podcasts ago uh, a run at 4 a.m in the brightness of Reykjavik's long days a couple months ago That's so cool i uh, was a good one but i won't go back into that one i'll go with the latter and uh, go full psycho mode so my father is from northern New Brunswick, which is like to the Americans, I don't know, Connecticut without people, I guess. And it's like Maine. It's Maine. It, well, oh, okay. well, it's it's right next to Maine. It, it, yeah, it my, is, yeah. my dad was born 20 minutes away from Maine. So I'm almost an American. But over there, when it's the winter, the winter hits hard and there aren't many places to go running. So we'd usually do indoor runs. One year, there were three storms in a row. We couldn't go anywhere. And I had a long run to do. And so I just left the house and they live right by the highway. So I ran 40 minutes out on the side of the highway in negative 10 degrees Celsius. Caitlin, let's have a Fahrenheit <laughs> conversion. She's like, I have no, no idea. I'm, no, I'm not good with me. It's very cold. Cold. Deep yeah, winter, like, let's yeah. say. Yeah, let's say 20 Fahrenheit. Okay. Maybe. Deep winter, Don't snowing can barely see anything. And I get to my 40 minute mark and I turn around and it's a long run. So I'm going nice and easy. And I turn around and I realized that the nuts that I had eaten earlier in the day, to which I'm allergic, were causing oh, no. a delayed allergic reaction. I was developing hives on my body everywhere. And this long run on the side of the road in God knows where New Brunswick became a progressive run 
very quickly <laughs> with two gears. And I think I ripped the fastest 10K in the middle of a storm back home. Chugged some Benadryl, went in the shower, and yeah. That He's was alive it. to tell the story. I, I thought that uh, you started talking about a bag of nuts, and I thought you were going a totally different direction with that one. I was like, where did you think I was going? I, I thought you were going poop with that one, but uh, no. Are kept it clean again no no we're not talking not talking poop not today not, not today. today guys come on although it's a key feature of many of many aborted or failed workouts right mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. caitlin you live in you live in fantasy land you could you could regale with us with tales of running in the jungle um i imagine you i imagine every single run you do is like uh a scene from Indiana Jones. I'm imagining like spiders webs, boulders rolling after you, uh, vines yeah. you must swing over. I I do have a Not very cool I'm, I'm... <laughs> Indiana Jones, guys, come on. Oh yeah. <laughs> I think you know, I have a very Indiana Jones moment. Unfortunately, it was a race instead of a workout, but I feel like I'm going to tell it anyway. So running this race, but it felt like a workout because at this moment I was alone on a trail in this place called Hacienda Pinilla, which is on, it's very close to the coast. But like Michael's saying, even though they're close to the coast, it's very jungly. So I'm in there. It's super early in the morning. It's a, it's an ultra run uh, starting out on the course. And my friends are going to make fun of me because I talk about it all the time. And they always make fun of me that I, that I tell this story. And a black jaguar. Cool. I mean, okay. scary. Cool. No, it was the coolest thing I've ever seen on a run. Just jumps from nowhere's land, from, from the jungle, and just pounces and just jumps across. And I see him just in full-fledged jumping mode to the other side and crosses my path about two meters in front of me. And I was like, and so it did turn into a workout because like Alex said, I mean, I'm starting an ultra and I ran as fast as I, first I was frozen and I watched and I looked behind me and I said, please let there be someone who saw that, someone else who saw that. And I was alone and I swear I ran as hard as I could to that next aid station. My heart rate was like in the 180s because first I was scared and second, I didn't know if it was going to come after me. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Wow. And yeah. How's your, how's your cat knowledge? Like I, I understand oh. that, that cheetahs are pretty docile, but leopards yeah. are more likely to attack humans. Where do jaguars fit? You know, I, they told me, because I actually didn't know what it was. I, I, what I did is I took like a mental picture of it because it was like black and gray and spotted and the size and the very square jaw. So when I got to the aid station, I mentioned to them because the photographer, a very famous photographer here was at that aid station. And I said, hey, you've got to go check this out. I just saw an animal and it looked like this. And I know it's a cat, but I'm not sure exactly what kind of cat. And they said, you saw a black jaguar and people come here and they camp out in this jungle. <laughs> And they wait to get a sighting of that Jaguar. So I wasn't that uh, familiar with it. I didn't know what it was at the time, but they said that it was, I probably startled the Jaguar and that's why he crossed my path. So yikes! it was that's... amazing. And I know I kind of like went beyond, like not, not quite a workout, but I did a workout after I saw an animal because I was so scared. You throw down like your, your 5k personal best <laughs> running. Running from a, a a jaguar. Oh my god! Yeah, no, that's uh, that's both amazing and terrifying. I think I went to I think I'd shit my pants there with that one. <laughs> Again, <laughs> back to poop. Yeah, <laughs> we did it. We got back. Now um, that's wild. Yeah, that is wild. That uh, I don't know. I can't. I can't. I can't see your jaguar and raise you a. What what's 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 more majestic and terrifying than a jaguar? Like a Bengal tiger? Like a, Michael I, had a story lined up about the blizzard that he ate on top of the hill. That's right. That's my 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 moment of eating ice cream halfway through a, a race or a, a a workout. I I've done I've done some some neat and weird ones before. I think we've all at some point found ourselves in a very isolated area, at least I have where like you've gone camping or you're on an Island, you're staying at a cottage or something like that. And you're having to run around like a, like a two or 300 meter loop over and over again, trying to get a workout in. I've definitely done it. I did it on a campsite like 10 or 12 years ago. I like, I was like, I cannot miss this workout. I'm going to run mile repeats 
in like a 250 meter trail loop around an island campsite in uh, rural Ontario. I've definitely done that. Um, I did the vertical mile in Chamonix and in in in, oh. in, in, uh, in France, uh, which is crazy and heart stopping and beautiful and terrifying because no one told me the last hundred or so meters is like basic mountain climbing mountaineering like vertical like you're like holding on to stuff and going up and then you look back and you're like i'm going up the end of a mountain here um but that's what it is and that was cool and then you run the switchback all the way back down afterwards and it's oh, absolutely cool. wild uh and very fast yeah there's i mean we've done so if you've run for any length of time you find yourself running in the weirdest environments i've got friends who've I, run in airports before uh weird treadmill workouts in weird parts of the world all that kind of thing so yeah we've all i've alex i don't know about you but like being canadian there's moments where you're out, like what you described there with the the being in a snowstorm it's like there's moments where you're out there and you're trying to get a workout or a long run in and you're like what am i doing right now this is insane you know? <laughs> yeah yeah, the worst the worst is when you have a hard workout to do and you can't do it outside because the weather's you could maybe pull off an easy run, but the footing and the weather is just too bad for a workout. And then you have to resort to the treadmill. Oh, and here we're back with Wahoo. And the treadmill doesn't go quickly enough or it's too boring or whatever it is, or they're all taken by people. That's why you buy the Wahoo treadmill. Anyway. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. Yeah. No, we've had those we've had those rough weeks where outdoors or indoors doesn't seem to work yeah well let's wrap it up with workouts you fear the most and or like kind of a workout that maybe you fear but you also know is the the kind of proving ground for when you're fit like one of these probably a workout you're doing late in the season it could be a workout you're doing in the beginning of the season because you're terrified to do it because you know you're out of shape and it's kind of like one of these rust buster type workouts or something that's like late in the season that's like a way for you to get feedback about where you're really at when you're trying to like set a goal. Hmm. Well, I've been in 10 K mode for the last few years. And so I have my regular 10 K tune up workout and there are two versions to it, the Canadian and the American version I've done both eight times. One kilometer is the Canadian version. 90 seconds of rest in between each kilometer Whoa. and you run a 10 K paced or 10k pace were slightly faster. The American version is five by a mile with mm. two and a half minutes of rest. That one I would keep to 10k pace. And it's the decider. It's I've come to fear it, I think, because there's a precedent in it. I do it once a season. So I know what's a good workout for me and what's not. And so it feels like I enter that workout with stakes. It's like the opposite of those crazy fartlek workouts where you have no expectations and no way of measuring whether or not you had a good day. This one's very measured. So yeah, it's the one I fear, but also one that I could not do a season without. That's, That's brutal. The, the running a 10 K in, in your workout with just 90 seconds rest between each kilometer is both a really robust nasty workout and also yeah. just sounds very painful well you yeah. do eight oh you do eight, eight. okay eight k or five by a mile so you don't end up hitting the full distance though uh yeah and those last two kilometers will make a difference oh wow yeah that sounds brutal i i mean when michael was mentioning the 800s i oh god any of those workouts i just they're really really tough on me but i'm thinking about one in particular to a different one. We have a workout that we do here. We call it the turbo and <laughs> cool another name. Um, it's called it the turbo and it is a 1.4 kilometer uphill um, route. It's a trail and we use it. So it's almost a mile, just about a mile. So we use it as like a test once a year with the running club to kind of like see how our climbing skills are. And, you know, it's got Strava segment. We're always trying to like get those times down or beat whoever, um, whoever has the, the first places and all of that. And so it's got 300 meters of vertical gain in 1.4 wow. kilometers. Whoa. Yeah, it is. Whoa. Brutal. So obviously you're 
and oh and the average incline is about 20 percent oh four percent yeah that's the average incline so you're basically trying to you run when you can but if you can hike faster you hike so it's also very strategic because you've got to say well if i'm gonna hike faster than i'm running then i've got to switch to hike mode so it's kind of like a back and forth of running hiking running power hiking and just just like absolutely cannot breathe uh for that chunk of time and uh, that's probably like the most brutal workout we do and luckily we only do it about once a year and we bring the the team and everybody tries you know takes a stab at it so it's really hard and then we just like jog back down another way like on the road very hard 20 that's an awful <laughs> grade that's it's awful <laughs> it's not it's not very nice <laughs> again i hear so many times we've been like that's brutal that's awful and then you're like oh yeah i guess we just like to suffer yeah, I guess it's the name of the game, right? Yeah. It's uh, especially when you're talking workouts. Although both Alex and I are, what what do we do, Alex, when we're invited down to Costa Rica for like a running training yeah, we, camp with Caitlin? We just oof. we're going. We bring our ice packs. Yeah, <laughs> man. I um, I'm going to bring my spare set of legs. Uh, <laughs> for me, one that comes to mind that I've done over the years that's almost become. It's almost become like a in, in within my circle of running friends like a a joke almost is it's not a joke but <laughs> at the end of the season before we run our goal marathon 10 days before the, the race we go out and we do it's like a total prep run it's we do 10k of marathon pace straight up we do it a few k to warm up 10k of marathon pace then like a couple of k to kind of bring the heart rate back down a bit and shut it down. It's probably usually 14 to 16 kilometers of total running, but with that core 10 K being the feature, being the workout, the last workout of the season. And it's like a dress rehearsal. Like you're encouraged to wear the, the, wear the outfit, uh, wear the shoes, the whole bit. And it's kind of funny and we all, you know, you show up and you're wearing these days, you're wearing super shoes and you're wearing the singlet you're going to race in and that sort of thing. And the shorts that your favorite, your favorite racing shorts, uh, some of the guys over the years have even like trying to take a, like choke down a gel 5k in just to kind of like, kind of create some sense of, even though you'd never take a gel 5k into a race, I don't, a marathon, I don't think, but it's become a parody because it's and also it's very nerve wracking because a I have run uh, really well and felt amazing and ran the pace very comfortably and then the marathon itself didn't feel as comfortable or amazing. <laughs> I have run the 10k and it felt like absolute hot garbage and I was like I'm totally effed for this race and then went and ran a PB in the marathon. So it's it's actually, in fact, a terrible indicator in many respects because it doesn't really indicate anything. So okay. it, we almost go into it as like a rite of passage or this like ridiculous parody of an indicator that we do, I guess, just out of like um, nostalgia for having done this so many times. Like, I don't know how many of these 10K prep runs 10 days before the marathon I've done in my life, but like quite a few now, and I will continue to do them until I stop running marathons with any sort of serious level of focus. But I just find it really funny going out and doing this. It's also a scenario where like, because it's marathon pace, it allows you to lie to yourself too, where you're just like huffing and puffing. Maybe you take a little quick glance at your watch and you see, oh, my heart rate's a little higher than I'd like it to be. Um, and, uh, and nevertheless, you carry on because you really want to believe that you can run that pace. I mean, it's just, it's a gong show, but it's something that we do. It's, it's an odd thing to do, but it's, it's part of Tradition. the, it's part of the ritual. It's part of the yeah. ritual. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And probably gets you in a good psychological groove. It's like a psychological warm up for the race. Cause, and you know, a marathon is different from a, a 1500, right? You probably haven't really lined up on a start line 
and started running at marathon pace for four or five, six months. I'm kind of a fan of that. I think that's pretty cool. So then you get to the start line, what, 10 days afterwards? And you're, you're prepared in a way. You kind of know what the first little while is going to feel like. I think that's really cool. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, there you go. You can, Alex, when you, yeah. when you join the, uh, the brother and sisterhood of marathon running, you can steal that workout. I'll hit you up in 15 years. Okay. All right, guys, that's it for, uh, that's it for workouts. That's it for this week. Uh, our summer running challenge, which we've got going on our first ever virtual running challenge is it's happening right now. Uh, got a whole bunch of people participating. We'll log in the miles, uh, and it's not too late to sign up, go to our website. You can sign up for it or subscribe to our newsletter. You can get information about it every day as well. And hey, 160,000 other runners can't be wrong. Subscribe to our newsletter. It's great stuff. Uh, give us a like and a rating for this podcast, wherever you're listening to the podcast. It'd be deeply appreciated. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Alex Sear is cranking out the hits. We've got his top five early season workouts video coming up. We've got his first look video at that Wahoo kicker run treadmill shoe reviews some amazing stuff coming up. all right guys thanks for joining me talk to you next week